I am David White, the Executive Director of the Virginia Maritime Association. For those of you that are not familiar with us, uh, we are the, the trade association, the business organization that represents the business interest of over 450 companies that have an interest in how well our port performs and operates. The maritime industry contributes over 730,000 jobs across the Commonwealth of Virginia and 14% of the gross state product. These are not my numbers, these are the numbers of the College of William & Mary, so you can, you can trust them. None of that happens without waterfront facilities and channels that allow for ships to come and go um, unobstructed. And, not, and that doesn't happen without our great partners here at the Corps of Engineers. And so on behalf of the Virginia Maritime Association, I want to thank everybody in the Norfolk District for the contributions that you make. But particularly today, we are recognizing the contributions that Richard has made. This week on Core Talk. If we didn't take the time, we would be at risk of, of proposing a project that could could either be subject to failure or would not be in the national interest. In other words, it might not be the best solution for the community. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're a team of professionals, biologists, engineers, real estate and administrative specialists, lawyers, and many other specialties, all working together to deliver engineering solutions that are vital to securing our nation, energizing our economy, and reducing disaster risks. Safely, on time, and within budget. This is Core Talk, the You Safe Norfolk District podcast. From harbor port deepening and coastal storm risk management to environmental restoration and research and development, we exist to serve our community because we are a part of it. SAIs. 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 Let us try. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Core Talk. Today, we're thrilled to have a very special episode titled A Legacy of Solutions. As we're joined by our distinguished guest, engineer, leader, and chief of our programs and civil works branch, Mr. Richard Klein. He's prepared to give us a glimpse into a 45-year USACE engineering career and a snapshot into the challenges, successes, and myths that come with you know, trying to reach that goal of providing solutions to some of the nation's and commonwealth's toughest challenges. Before we begin, Mr. Klein, could you give us a bit of history, a little bit of background about how you started with the Corps and what the journey has been like for you? I started at GS5 as a civil engineer in a program at the time called the Junior Engineer in Training Program, or JET. It was an internship program. I didn't know about that program when I was in college. My hometown is, is in the Pittsburgh area in Pennsylvania. And I graduated with a degree in civil engineering and engineering public policy. So I was seeking employment in the private sector as well as the public sector in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and I really could not find a good job in the Pittsburgh area that I thought w was what I would like to do. And the core actually offered more money to move here than the jobs in the Pittsburgh area. So that's what I ended up doing. I moved here mainly because the Corps has a great reputation. I knew about them, but I didn't know what they did here at Norfolk District. I, in the Pittsburgh area, I knew they had locks, dams, and they did a lot of large Civil Works projects. I figured they did that here. But it was great to learn here that they also have small ports and large deep draft ports as well as some other projects. So that was really interesting to me to start to get into. When I arrived there, I found out my first job would be at Fort Lee, now called Fort, uh, Bra uh, Fort Greg Adams, at the construction field office. So I was there for six months and had some great um, colleagues and mentors there, notably Bill Robson, an engineer who you'll see on the Wall of Fame downstairs, and uh, was a project engineer working with several different construction contractors, and there were some other colleagues that started there as well, um, Bill Sorrentino, Tom Freeberg, and Sam McGee, just to name a few of them. 
after that six months at Fort Lee in construction, moved here to Norfolk. I've been here in Norfolk pretty much ever since and rotated through the sections in engineering. Uh, at that time, general engineering in the planning branch, um, structural engineering, geotechnical engineering, civil engineering, cost estimating, and also in our uh, computer department where I was able to do some Fortran programming. That, I, that was one of my skills I picked up in college. That was a great experience exposed to a lot of, a lot of things we do on the military side and the civil work side. And at the end of that six months, I was surprised to end up in what's called the Waterways and Harbors Engineering section, which I had not been through in the internship program. But that's where they needed some people at the time. I had a, um, a great supervisor there named Gene Whitehurst. He was, he was uh, really a mentor. Um, I started learning all about dredging because waterways and harbors engineering is all about the navigation dredging projects uh, throughout the Commonwealth, uh, small ones, large ones, and few in between. Dredging and all its associated problems was, was brand new to me, and I, as an engineer, I delved into it, felt like I wanted to become an expert, and was you know, eager to learn everything I could about dredge pumps, transporting water-soil mixtures and pipelines, dredge material disposal, decanting the water off the sites, everything of that nature. I um, joined the Western Dredging Association and, and even was able to uh, present a technical paper one time at that association. So that was, that was a great experience early on in my career. At that time, there was a lot of camaraderie among the, uh, the engineers and scientists. I spent about one third of my career pretty much as a project engineer, so, so going through a lot of projects as the, as the lead engineer, and then the next one third as an engineering supervisor, where I had uh, five or six civil engineers I supervised, and they, they would lead the technical teams on the um, various navigation projects, and we also had the in our section, the cartographic technicians that made all the, all the drawings uh, for the dredging projects. When I started, they, they used, still use pen and ink on uh, Mylar, but, but then eventually we developed the use of uh, CAD, so that, that was a quick evolution. And that, for some of them, that was a pretty big shock to learn how to, how to use computers instead of, you know, it's a real artistry to be able to draw uh, projects on, on a drafting board. Specifically, what time frame, what, when, is, when was this changeover happening? This was happening in the 1980s. Okay. Yeah, pretty much in the 1980s. Um, the district was starting to get more computers at that time. We, we always had the mainframe, and we had a, had a couple small systems that were specialized, like word processing. But in the 1980s, computer technology really, you know, with the PC, we, we all started getting into computers in the 1980s and early 1990s. And then in the latter part of my career, as a, as a program manager, I've enjoyed um, watching the projects develop, helping the project managers develop with the project delivery teams. And um, I've had roles in, in not just navigation dredging, but also flood and coastal storm risk management and aquatic ecosystem restoration, seeing those projects develop. So from start in a training program to where I am now, I've, I've been through almost every uh, civil works process in in the three business lines. If you could, could you share some of the highlights that you've had since you started as project engineer until reaching the current position that you hold now? I would imagine you've been in different positions where you've been able to gain perspective from different points as to what it means to provide solutions for the community, what it means to work with the stakeholders. Can you kind of hint to us what it looked like to be working towards the same goal, but from each one of those different perspectives. So I mentioned Gene Whitehurst. He was a, an early uh, mentor, and he was my supervisor for um, many years, and his expertise was in relationships. He was all about meeting with the people who were uh, stakeholders of the project and working with them to develop solutions and getting their support, and we need their support for providing not only um, land for the dredge material disposal, but also in gaining support for the project and funding with Congress. So, so that's a vital role, working with the community to um, 
listen to what their needs are and to work with them to develop solutions and gain support and funding. I learned from him that every one of our projects has a group of stakeholders. He worked with uh, city managers, county administrators, everybody, and local watermen. Um, so it was, it was all about relationships with him. After learning the ropes from him, I was able to do this on my own, managing projects, setting up meetings in the field with the stakeholders, and finding out what the needs are and developing solutions. I also had another mentor and supervisor, Ronald Van. He emphasized technology, and he had a long-term vision. So we have a lot of computers today. We didn't have so many back then, but he did emphasize using the models that are available and, and getting field data. So that was, he always felt like getting, getting the data in the field w were important for engineering solutions and then using models whenever, whenever they were available. And his, his long-term vision relating to the community was for each project to have a long-term solution so that when the project needed to be dredged again, you already had the solution ready. So the long-term planning would pay off in the future. And that, that really did come about. And after him, another uh, colleague and mentor, Betty Gray Waring, who was my supervisor for a while, we did start together though as, as young engineers. She was an environmental engineer and I was a civil. She's all about building relationships with the environmental agencies, another, another component of the um, Commonwealth. This was, this was something that Mr. Van also emphasized, but if we could build relationships with the agencies and have regular meetings, then we would work with them to find solutions that were acceptable to the environmental agencies, not just in the Commonwealth, but also there's a few federal agencies we work with, such as National Ocean Service and Fish and Wildlife Service. Right. So that was important as well to develop those relationships. And the long-term planning also played into having great solutions that they could accept investing in something that they could accept for the long term. And she was also very uh, firm in her belief that we needed to work towards executing these projects. So we not only need, needed to have relationships, but work towards solutions and not just, you know, continuing to study or, or be, uh, you know, diverted from, from the goal. So you mentioned, you learned from your mentors that there was an emphasis on relationships on technology data and the long-term usefulness of the solutions that you were providing. How much has that shifted for you over the last 45 years? Well, it's shifted in, in that that was sort of like relationships at the local level, but it's shifted in that I had a, another supervisor and mentor, Jim Thomason, who developed partnerships. So this was an example is the James River. Uh, we, we were forever struggling to get enough money to maintain the James River. And the Port of Richmond wasn't happy with us. They were complaining to the district engineer. Jim Thomason's solution, I was fortunate to be with him and some other engineers in developing this, was to develop what he called the James River Partnership. That, we just had the 26th partnership last week, but the first one was in, in the mid-1990s, and we, we brought together all the stakeholders, agencies, uh, shipping agents, everybody involved with the James River, and really just talk through what we really need to do to, to assure we can maintain the James River in the future. And that continues to this day to be a very, very important partnership to focus on what's needed to keep the James River channel maintained. He also had the idea of developing what's called the Hampton Roads Navigation Summit. That was another Jim Thomason idea, but that was a even, could say, larger group of stakeholders, the whole port of Hampton Roads, and port, which is now called Port of Virginia. So we, we brought together stakeholders, Coast Guard, Navy, uh, the port, shipping agents. We brought together uh, Corps of Engineers expertise, and we developed the Hampton Roads Navigation Summit, where we meet annually and discuss what the needs are, what the, what the priority projects are, that has also been able to, to bring focus on getting funding for these projects and, and solutions. That's been quite successful. When we started, we weren't even really thinking about the Norfolk Harbor 55-foot deepening, but over the course of years, that became one of the focuses, and we actually are bringing that to fruition. So 
that's I think that the change over the years has been from more focus on the local individual project level and and now it's a, a focus at a, at a higher level more of a you know regional focus on partnerships I think I, one I just think it's fascinating just to you've seen these expand over the years right so like when you started these partnerships did you think that they were going to grow to this to be this big and this important and this vital to kind of all the things that we're doing in this area or was it just like hey I just I'm just building relationships because my boss told me to and and now you've seen it grow over the years right where you said 26 for James River I know all the stuff with the port is continuing to grow and expand with the number of people that are participating did, did not expect that um, Major Funkhauser for example in the James River was really at the time we were really only receiving a million and a half to two million dollars a year to try to maintain a, a 90 mile channel and we developed a goal to get five million dollars a year we were successful in doing that and now I believe they're they're averaging around 10 million dollars a year in maintenance funds same thing with the Norfolk Harbor priority projects there were I think there were five projects identified and we're still working on some of those but but as a result of that, we've been able to get the um, Norfolk Harbor deepening fully funded, almost $500 million coming from the port and the Corps of Engineers to complete that project. We're getting funding for the Craney Island Easter expansion. We're getting started again on the southern branch deepening. And, of, of course, the, uh, the, the amount of maintenance work we're doing in Norfolk Harbor has been phenomenal. The amount of funding we've been getting there at the time we started the, the navigation summit, I think we were probably receiving only four or five million dollars a year on maintenance funds. Now it's well over ten million a year on the Norfolk Harbor project. So it's been successful. Never never figured, but that was a, a great vision that Jim Thomas and others had. Yeah, it's, that's awesome just to see it kind of progress over the years. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Because with your expertise, with your knowledge, you could have gone to work anywhere in the country. Why did you stay here for 45 years? Great question, James, and it's really the people. I, I've enjoyed working with everybody here and, and my family. They've supported me, um, two sons and wife here. They've, they've gone through all levels of school here, um, college in Virginia. Um, we don't see them much because they've moved out of Virginia, but the people and family are really what have kept me here. Over the, over the years, uh, I, I had opportunities to uh, deploy, you know, as others have, to you know, different emergency events. But I was often the person who would pick up the slack and work on the projects left behind when someone else would go to the, you know, the flood on the Mississippi or the hurricane in Florida. You know, so right. I, was, I was always willing to pick up, the, pick up where somebody left off and make sure that everything was accomplished here. But the, the job is, is fulfilling in that you can work with great technical problems, great people, and develop relationships with uh, the Commonwealth, with, with all the cities and counties developing solutions. It's rare. Um, before me, Robert Pretlow worked 44 years here. So I would say Norfolk District has a history of people that have worked here for long careers. There's, there's others that have, are here today that have worked even longer in the Corps of Engineers that haven't retired yet. But I think that's that's not the norm any longer. I mean, people people are more um, able to telework and get jobs, even if they don't have to move from here, get jobs elsewhere. But we, we didn't have that sort of thing. So, really, I, I think it's been been great being here. But I don't I don't regret uh, anybody that wants to um, do the work here and then find work elsewhere if that's what they want to do. I mean, we people should seek seek what they want to do. Definitely. I have another question. So oh, you mentioned several of the mentors that you had while you were here since you started. At some point, or when did you realize that you were becoming a mentor for somebody else? And did that have an impact on how you approached things? Or did you continue to use to leverage the mentorship that was given to you previously as you were providing mentorship to another engineer? I, I don't know when it dawned on me, but I, I would have to say it's, it's in the latter part of my career. James, that something that happened um, about 10 years ago, I, I was the chief of the programs branch and we had, uh, we had the civil works programs and we had program analysts and, and, and program managers, but the deputy district engineer at the time proposed 
reorganizing to have the Civil Works project managers come under my, my uh, branch. We did that, so I gained, uh, at the time, four Civil Works project managers. And I think that's when I really started uh, gaining skills in, in mentoring the, the project managers because I had a lot of insight on what's needed to develop a program, make sure we have the funding stream and the support. And, and then I had some, some skills as project manager from previous uh, work I did in navigation. So I was able to work with the project managers and help them develop their skills and bring the projects to fruition. And at that time, we had just about four project managers. Now we have seven. And we've had some people come and go, but uh, I've just enjoyed working with every one of them, help them develop their skills. And if they if they choose to move on to other other parts of their career, that, that happens. We, I've had um, project managers that I've helped develop move on to positions at North Atlantic, move on to other districts, move on to um, uh, jobs in the private sector, and of course a few just just went on to retirement. But it's been it's been great working with those individuals and uh, seeing them develop. And I, I don't want to neglect to mention I've I've enjoyed working with the program analysts over the years as well. It, um, they they play a key role in developing these projects to to come about. You mentioned the integration of computers and AutoCAD before. So as technology changes, your approach to problem solving also changes, I would imagine. And the education that an, that an engineer receives in university in preparation to you know begin their careers would also change. I, I, I think what you're getting at is the core has, has always tried to bring technology to solving problems. And now, and now technology's at the forefront, it seems. Like, for example, in, in flood risk management or coastal storm risk management, the Corps has developed all the models which are used for predicting water levels and developing the economics to support projects to solve solutions for, for communities. And they all, have, they all have acronyms like Beach FX and GCR, G2 CRM, things like that, but they are they really are engineering models to to help find solutions. And the core has this um, technology, and and we're recognized for being able to bring these solutions to the communities. And that's been that's been a really interesting part of the project management side, um, working with the planning teams to develop these projects. And we've had. We fortunately we've had um, several of these in the last ten years. We've been able to bring through the uh, project process to a chief's report, which is really the the gold standard for a decision document recognized by Congress. So we we've had great leaders in our planning planning office, uh, you know, from uh, Mark Mansfield who retired about ten years ago to Susan Layton and now Michelle Hamer. So we have an excellent excellent planning team that collaborates with engineering, with economics, and we, we reach out across the region, even bringing in expertise from other regions, and develop teams that'll, that'll find solutions for these problems. As you know, we've even taken our expertise to Florida and New York and New Jersey to help other districts. We really have great leaders on the technical side. Okay. Aaron Edmondson, Keith Lockwood, Shell Hamer, Brandon Harris, for example, great leaders on the technical side. So we're on the project management side or program program development side. We're bringing the teams together so they can collaborate and find solutions. One of the things I've, I've noticed, James, is that with communication, electronic communication that we have, there's a lot more collaboration. E even though we have people that are working remotely and we do a lot of telework, I think today compared to 30 years ago, there's just better communication. Engineers, I think, early in my career would, would work more by themselves, work more in a vacuum to find solutions. But now there is so much more collaboration. And engineers will collaborate with environmental scientists. With, uh, within the district, we reach out to other regions and we use um, what's called ERDIC, the Engineer Research and Development Center. It used to be called the Waterways Experiment Station when I was young, but they, they, they're they one of the foremost uh, engineering labs in the nation in hydraulics 
and that we use them. So I think that the difference that's evolved over my career is the communication has allowed for a lot better collaboration. The engineers are, are more willing to uh, share you know, across disciplines as opposed to it was more of a stack or a stovepipe back in the day where the, you know, the engineers came up with their drawings and said this is what we're going to do. But now we collaborate on everything. When I first started as a young engineer, um, I'm not, not sure if you know about this, but there was what was known as the Keypone crisis in the James River. There was a pesticide called Keypone released at Hopewell. It got into the sediments of the lower James River from Hopewell on down to uh, Newport News area. There was an impasse on dredging. There was no dredging in that part of the James River. And as a young engineer, I was assigned to uh, that project and we developed, this is before the, the, um, the project management system developed, you know, what we call the project management business process or the project delivery process. But as a young engineer, I worked with some folks in the district to develop a team. We had a, an engineering consultant, a local dredging company. We had stakeholders, we had the agencies, everybody collaborated to come up with a solution and we actually uh, tested dredging equipment in the James River to determine if it was possible to dredge the sediment safely and not spread the keypone contamination further. We were able to do that. We, we did a, a monitoring program and we showed that we could safely dredge the James River and we received buy-in from our stakeholders and agencies and we've been able to maintain the James River ever since then. That was a big... Uh, achievement early in my career and I, I, I really enjoyed working with, with um, everybody but the challenge at the time was we didn't have a project management system we didn't have what we call a project management plan concept so we it was just a just a, a undefined process to bring everybody together and make make it all work but it, it came together that particular problem that arose doesn't seem very predictable how have you seen the the needs of the community fluctuate over the years. One thing that came about, James, this was, this was around 1986, was cost sharing. So that, that was a big evolution in the, in the change in dealing with communities, the Commonwealth and some of the communities, that after Water Resources Development Act of 1986, or WERDA 1986, cost sharing became a reality in developing new projects. And at that time, a lot of project development had been held up because of the debate in Congress on whether or not there should be cost sharing. So that was sort of like a, uh, a breakthrough for that, that to be passed. And from then on, all major Civil Works projects in development have cost sharing at the study phase, the design phase, and the construction phase. I worked with another engineer at that time, Sam McGee. He and I headed up the technical engineering of that project at Norfolk Harbor Deepening. And he did the project reports and I did the development of the plans and specs and we were able to execute with cost sharing with the Port Authority one of the first 50-foot uh, projects in the nation in the, in the uh, late 1980s. We, so that was a change where it wasn't simply the Corps of Engineers having 100% of the funds and deciding what to do. With cost sharing we now had to have a lot of collaboration with our partner on what their needs were and what the solution needed to be. So at the time, we decided w w with our partner that we didn't need the full channel. We could, we could break it into phases, and we, we did what we called the 50-foot outbound lane. The needs changed. Container ships started getting much larger. So in addition to the need for the outbound channel, which was primarily for the coal industry, exporting coal. Mm -hmm. Now we had a greater need for the full width of the channel for imports on the larger container ships. So those evolved in the late 1990s and, and the 2000s. The ships got bigger. The needs of the port were different. Uh, this port began to grow in terms of becoming uh, one of the larger container terminals on the East Coast. Um, when I started my career, there was not a whole lot of container movement in this port, but they, over time, I think it was in the 
1990s, this port surpassed Baltimore, and now they're the uh, between the second and third, depending on you know how Savannah's doing. It's it's right now the third largest container port on the East Coast, and mm-hmm. so that's evolved, and so the solutions have evolved to support these larger ships. Right. And more recently, nobody predicted when the channel was authorized in 1986 that we would have these super large container vessels, or ultra large, they call them, that, that carry uh, 14,000 container units. So the approaches to problem solving have definitely grown with the needs of, of the Commonwealth in, in relationship to the economy and all this stuff coming into the port. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. In many cases, the the partners have gotten a lot more sophisticated. They have their, their own staff that, that knows a lot about the, the work. And this is because of the era of cost sharing. So when, when they have skin in the game, so to speak, they have a share. It's, it's a 50% share during the study, and, it, and then during design and construction, the share varies depending on the type of work, but it ranges from 35% to 50%. When they have money they're having to put forward to develop the project, they have a lot of interest in the results. And so consequently, they most of the communities now, the larger ones, the cities, the Commonwealth, have their own expertise that they bring to the table. When we started doing some of these projects when I was young, for example, the um, the first phase of the Norfolk Harbor 50-foot deepening, we did. We simply went down to the Port Authority and would talk to the to the director and the uh, general counsel, and we would develop the project documents and you know reach agreement on the financing plan. and And it was not a big process. And then they would rely on the Corps of Engineers to carry out the work. But over time. The port has developed their own expertise. The cities have, for example, the city of Norfolk has a, a resilience department, which is focused just on the uh, the city's needs for you know sea level rise, future, making sure communities are resilient. And so, they bring a lot of expertise to the table as well. I think that's the big difference that's evolved. Is that 30 years ago the core was the sole expert in most areas, but now. The communities, the larger ones especially, are developing their own expertise. And we see this also in, in you know, Miami, Collier, um, the project we're doing in New Jersey. It's not just the, the local projects. It's, it's all the projects we're supporting. The communities bring their own resources to the table. It helps us see things that we're not seeing from their perspective, right, because they all have their own, their own needs and desires to help support their community. And, and obviously we want to help. Yeah. Um, but just like I said, for like the Miami and Collier County ones, like we don't live there. We don't know what they want or need. We're just building the design that supports the requirements that we're supposed to give. So it's good to get their input. And I know um, sometimes it probably does make it more challenging, um, but it, it's good to have, you know, that collaboration with each of the, our, our partners and communities that we're supporting. I wonder if that takes us into the next topic I want to talk about, which is some of the, the myths associated with the civil works process. One of the myths I'm going to bring up is, uh, and and I remember this from my younger days, that the, the Corps does pork barrel projects. The Corps of Engineers does pork barrel projects. And there there was a lot of criticism. You, you could you could go back and, and find articles about this. Pork barrel meaning political projects that that um, are, are meant to gain votes. Okay. But, but the Corps of Engineers has a, a great reputation for having a what I call the gold standard of project development. It, it's, a, it's a lengthy process, it, it's, but it's one that when, we, when we, the Corps of Engineers goes through this process in partnership with a non-federal sponsor, with the, the port or with a city or county, we end up with a solution that will pass the test of Congress and the administration. It's called a chief's report. That is like the gold standard in project development, and, and it's, it comes about through a rigorous planning process. So I think that's one of the myths that we just do whatever Congress tells us to do. No, we, we develop these projects with, with a set of standards, and they, they bring um, benefits 
not only to the region and the local economy, but national benefits. So, so that's why we, we develop projects that are considered in the federal interest. And please um, entertain me for a second. I'm, I'm going to ask a question that might seem a little silly to you, but just wh where do you think that that myth comes from, that misconception? It probably came from the era when th there was an era when uh, Congress would add projects, they called them earmarks. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the Corps of Engineers, but you've heard of things like the, you know, the bridge somewhere that nobody needs or the, or the, or the, the, the channel system somewhere that has one user or, you know, things like that. There, there, you can always find bad examples of projects, but, right. but we know, we no longer, we're no longer doing projects like that. What other misconceptions have there been that you've noticed during your time? I think there's a misconception that our process takes a long time. It seems like a long time, but, but we had this thing called a three by three study, three years and $3 million. Now, we're finding that some of them need more than three years and more than $3 million, but the, the standard started out as three by three and somebody would say, well, you guys take a long time and that's a lot of money. But, the, but actually, three years goes quickly and compared to the way projects took a lot longer in the past to develop, it, it really goes pretty quickly. And an example, a couple examples of, of projects that have come along relatively quickly, the, um, the Norfolk Harbor deepening. So even though it was authorized in 1986, we, we we constructed parts of it in, in elements up through the 90s and 2000s up to the 50-foot inbound channel. But now when it came to doing the 55-foot, enough time had elapsed that we were required to do what's called a reevaluation. So we started that in 2015, kept it on schedule, finished in 2018 with the Chief's report, received additional authorization, in, in word of 2018, right away started design in 2019, finished design and we got approval for the new construction start in 2022, and we already are fully funded for completing the project. So, and the, the horizon for completion is around 2025. So in 10 years time, that project was brought from development all the way through right now, we can see we're just a couple years away from completion. So that, to me, that's relatively fast to develop a major project. The same thing with the city of Norfolk project. We had a, um, a great planning chief that retired, Mark Mansfield. He was able to get, uh, help get the authorization, work with Congress to get the authorization for the study. Mm -hmm. But it took a while to get the funding for the study. It took, and you know, the impetus was uh, Hurricane Sandy after Hurricane Sandy, there was a big push to um, look at the, all these projects that, that need attention in terms of coastal flooding and resilience and sea level rise. The city of Norfolk has been great in, in uh, developing on their side of the project, but we were not able to get the funding to start the study until 2016. But once we got the funding for the study, took three years. After three years, we went into design, finished the, the initial design effort and got authorization for construction starting in 2023 with uh, you know the bipartisan infrastructure law funds that came in in 2022. So there, there's some, been some glitches along the way for that project, but again, it's relatively fast to get from start to where we're in the construction phase right now from 2016 to 2023, and we're, we're developing plans and specs for construction. It's, it's fascinating how you, you talk about this whole, you know, 10 years is fast, right? For like the younger generation, like 10 years may seem like an eternity. Right. Um, it's just a different culture of how they've grown up over time, right? Everything is now, now, now. Um, so for us to take that appetite suppressant um, and understand like, hey guys, it's not just you finishing a project, it's not just your project. Everything that you've been talking about, it's all the stakeholders, it's Congress, it's the Chief's Report, um, it's all the, the folks here at the district that are 
you know, helping support the project, and it takes time. Environmental impact studies. Yeah, all the studies. We're not just focusing on one project. We're mm -hmm. doing hundreds of projects, and everyone's trying to balance their time across all those hundreds of projects. So yeah, three years may seem like a lot to the stake or to the you know individual that's at the beach, like where's my wall to protect me from the flood. Um, but that's not necessarily the case because we're trying to do that for everybody and ac across all these different places. So it's just really cool to see you kind of explain it and walk through the process. Are you sharing those lessons learned uh, and that with the younger folks that are in the organization to help them see the kind of the bigger picture of how we're doing business here? Yes. Uh, we have some uh, younger project managers and some experienced ones and sharing all that with them. And so they're, they're the ones that are leading these projects. So they're, they're learning as they go. Um, the, the main thing is to get started. It is a long process. There's a lot of steps to it, but it, it does result in success when it's followed. What would be sacrificed if we actually did move faster? What would be the consequences? What would be the cost of that? If we didn't take the time to do the analysis, the, uh, the planning, the environmental, the economics, the engineering, we would be at risk of of proposing a project that could could either be subject to failure or would not be in the national interest. In other words, it might not be the best solution for the community. So we have we have safeguards in the process. We actually have um, for flood projects. We have this rigorous review process for for projects where life might be at risk. Mm -hmm. It's called safety assurance review, and and also all. All aspects of the work go through different levels of review, a, a, first a district review and then what's called an agency technical review where you, you bring in core experts to review the documents. And then, we, at, then when we're developing contract documents, we do the uh, biddability, constructability, operability, sustainability review. All these reviews assure that we have a quality product that will meet the community's needs. I think if you bypass any of those steps, you, you risk, you could be risking people's lives or you could be risking that you're, you're spending money uh, needlessly on something that's not producing national benefits. What are some of the key lessons you've learned in building the relationships with both the stakeholders and the partners over time? I think one of the lessons is um, the frequency of communication really helps. Uh, one thing I've observed thinking back is when we would work with our stakeholders and partners, we would call them up on the phone and we would arrange a meeting and go out and meet them on the site. But we might only do that one time or two times in terms of de developing the project. But now we are continually communicating with our partners and stakeholders. I look on, look on my calendar at, at uh, all the meetings the project managers put on my calendar. I can't attend all of them, but we are having, in most cases, a minimum of monthly meetings on every project with the, with the partner or stakeholders. We're having, in some cases, bi-weekly meetings. And in some of the more intensive projects, depending on the complexity and, and level of effort at the time, we're doing, we're doing weekly meetings with the sponsor and we're doing weekly meetings internally to you know to organize the team so there's been a lot more communication knowing what you know because you're also a member of the community could you discuss some of the blind spots that we might have with the community or might the community might have when considering how USACE operates and how we approach providing solutions for the commonwealth so I, I am a member of the community. I, I live in the city of Norfolk, and so I'm obviously a taxpayer in the city of Norfolk and in the Commonwealth and federal, all three levels. I, uh, I've been involved with the city of Norfolk Coastal Storm Risk Management Project from its inception, uh, but I have imagined that, this, that the residents of the city have a much different vision of what it is we're we're proposing than what we think we're we're doing, and, and I don't know that that has. I know we're working on it, but I don't think that we have touched every community that is going to be affected by that project to 
integrate our vision of the project with theirs and make sure that, that there's an understanding. And, and that even gets into the fact that our project is not going to solve all their water problems. That might be a blind spot. So when, when for example, if you're, if you're driving on Princess Anne Road out towards Virginia Beach and there's a heavy rainstorm and the road floods, you might think, oh, the Army Corps of Engineers project will solve that. Well, no, it won't. We're, our project is for coastal flooding, not, right. not rainfall flooding from the interior, although our project will pump rainwater out from behind the wall, but it won't solve some of these precipitation problems that happen quickly with, with, you know, with sudden rainstorms. And I think that's where there's a blind spot, where there, there might be different communities that think, oh, okay, the core and the city are going to solve all this. That, that's, that's one blind spot. And then we, we probably have blind spots where we, we're not really thinking about putting ourselves in the shoes of, of this community on what's going to happen to them when we start building it, when we start tearing up their neighborhood and putting the solution through their neighborhood. You know, it's, it's really hard for us to imagine uh, living through that, but that's what's going to have to happen in some, in some parts of the community. There, there's going to be um, some construction going on for a period of years. And I think we have that blind spot as well. So we really, I think the communication is, is getting in place. I know, that, I know that Mark and you and others are working, on, working with the city on communication, but I think there just has to be uh, a lot of communication on each phase of that project on the vision of what's coming and what the effects to the community are going to be and what the, you know, what the benefits are going to be end result. In terms of uh, ecosystem restoration, we're, we're doing a lot of that, that type of work in the communities. Um, not as visible because it's out in the water. We're doing oyster reefs that are you know, out in the water. But in, in the um, Lynn Haven River Basin, for example, our, our vision of what we uh, see for the Lynn Haven River Basin maybe doesn't coincide with the local residents. Maybe they Maybe they think that uh, we shouldn't have a reef, and so we, we have to do a lot of communication on why we should have an oyster reef in the Lynn Haven River Basin. So we've been through that, and now we're going through that with submerged aquatic vegetation. Chesapeake Bay Oyster Program. That one, I don't, I don't know there's a lot of blind spots with the community because most of those are, are kind of remote, like Piangatank River, Great Wacomica River, there's there's not a lot of people that that really see that or you know abut that, so I think mainly the blind spots are in in the uh, projects where we work with the local community to put a solution right in their neighborhood. What advice would you give to the new generation of engineers who are continuing the mission of the Corps, left to them by, by professionals by yourself? What what guidance do you have? I would I would say foremost at the beginning of your career, develop your competency in your field. Don't neglect that. And what I mean by that is, if you feel you need to get a master's degree, work on that. If you feel you need to get uh, professional standing, like a professional engineer, professional architect, or uh, professional geologist, some sort of accreditation, pursue that and achieve that. Don't put that off, because if you put that off, Later in your career, it just gets so hard to go back and do that. So first and foremost, engineers, scientists, anybody in the Corps of Engineers should get their credentials first. Make sure you get that. Take advantage of developmental opportunities when they come up. That was something I wasn't really very good at. I had a few developmental opportunities, but there are great opportunities. There, there's um, training in leadership. There are development programs that we have where different levels, you know, at each level there's a development program. The, the senior level or the executive level, you actually um, go to another organization, another district or another division for a, like a 120-day stint developing yourself in, a, in an area you're not comfortable in. And that's a great thing to do, and it gives you a lot of exposure to other parts of the core. And in terms of engineers, I'm an engineer. Engineers are known to be for the most part, reticent. You know, we're not 
we, we tend to be not outspoken. We, we tend to listen and maybe take a long time to uh, say something. But I would say get out of your comfort zone, learn to express your opinion and be more outspoken, uh, and interact with other professionals on the team. So don't just keep in your own orbit. You know, make sure you interact with and collaborate with others on your team. And lastly, I would say to, to young uh, engineers, scientists, anybody in the core, don't be afraid of project management. When, when I was young and they first developed the project management organization that we call Programs and Project Management Division now, or PPMD, I, I was, at the time I was thinking, no, I want to stay in the technical area because I like the technical area. But I have really enjoyed project management and, and leading project managers. So consider project management as a career choice. We have project managers who are engineers, scientists, um, economists. So it doesn't just have to be a certain type. You know, we have we have roles for for all types of people if they want to go into project management. So that's some advice I have. Think about that later in your career or at any time you feel like you you've gotten your credentials built in your technical area. You have a super in-depth knowledge of civil works, understanding all the policies and regulations that are out there. Every time we have conversations at some of these partnership meetings, I, I see everyone look at you when there's a question asked because they know you're the SME. You have all the understanding of all the ins and outs of how civil works operates and, and works in terms of how we work with Congress, how we get everything through our, our vertical chain. I think that's what we are trying to get at here today was it's, it's capturing all the knowledge that you have because we know there's going to be a gap that is lost once you leave. Um, and we're, we're reliant on that mentorship that you provided over the years to ensure that we're sharing that knowledge, right? Everything that you learned over those 45 years somehow has to be passed on. And, you know, there's only so much a continuity book uh, can share or, you know, all of your desk files can share because there's a lot more information in your head that we, we are going to lose and we're going to miss. Whatever you have on your mind of what you would say to either the core, the community, the partners and stakeholders regarding your experience as an engineer working with them over the last 45 years or the significance of the mission here at the core, what would that be? I would start by uh, thanking my colleagues within the Corps of Engineers at the district and what and what we call the the vertical team in the enterprise, the um, you know the region, the the division on up to headquarters. I've I've really enjoyed working with the entire core team over the years and the relationships I've had with folks at the district level, at the North Atlanta division and headquarters level, and then with the with the um, communities. I, I've had a great relationship with the Port Authority over the years from the 1980s to the present with the Virginia Maritime Association. I've really appreciated uh, the being colleagues with, with them. They bring a whole different set of ideas to the table. The, the, you know, their, their interests are in uh, the port. Our interests are in developing projects, but we bring that together. And I, I just think it's been a great collaboration over the years. And in terms of Working with the communities, I've enjoyed working with every one of them. The one thing that I do want to ask, every employee uh, distinguishes their time by the number of commanders that they've worked for. How many commanders have you worked for here at the district? I haven't counted them recently, but starting with Newman Howard on, on the wall out there, that was the first one. So it's probably been 20. I have to go back and count them. But yeah, I mean, that's fascinating because I mean, a lot of employees that I'm talking to, they're like five, four, you know, 20 district commanders that you've seen come through. The, and I'm sure everyone's got a different philosophy. They ultimately have the same goals of, you know, supporting. Well, maybe, maybe more like 15 because 45 divided by three they is more like 15 or 16, something, yeah. like that. something like that. Yeah. It's still, like I said, it's the legacy of, of those years, the 45 years that you've been here that you've kind of seen everything evolve over time. Um, and it's just fascinating to just think about that. You know, hopefully I can continue to do this in my in my career and, and you know, take some of the wisdom that you've passed down to, to me, not necessarily directly, but indirectly, 
um, uh, and share that with the folks that are here while I'm in the office. Sir, thank you very much for sharing your incredible journey and insights with us today. Your contribution is most definitely an inspiration to all the engineers. To our listeners, we hope that this episode has given you a deeper understanding of the critical work done here by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Please don't forget to subscribe for more episodes and feel free to share your thoughts and concerns and any feedback that you might have so that we can try to address that or include that into future episodes. Until next time, thanks for joining us for Core Talk. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, James. Thank you. Both of you, James. He gives other people credit. He seldom takes credit for himself. He's transparent. He coaches. He teaches. He mentors others. And I know you've mentored countless district commanders before me, but you've been a great mentor and a coach to me, especially someone that's done tactical operations. I know how to blow things up. I know what a mine clearing line charge is, but I definitely didn't understand the civil works process until I met you and you coached me and taught me through some very difficult challenges.